Welcome to the Sharkpreneur Podcast with Kevin Harrington and Seth Green. Kevin Harrington is the inventor of the infomercial, one of the original sharks from the hit TV show Shark Tank, and has generated over $5 billion in TV and digital direct response sales. Seth Green is the world's first trusted authority on cutting edge direct response marketing, a best-selling author, and the only three-time Marketer of the Year nominee. On the podcast, Kevin and Seth interview sharkpreneurs who share straight talk on what it takes to explode your business. Why do so many businesses struggle while others seem to explode overnight? Do you wish you had the secret to this type of exponential growth? Now, I've scaled more than 20 businesses to over $100 million, and it's not just luck. In my new book with Mark Tim, Mentor to Millions, you'll learn the repeatable framework I use in all my business ventures for massive success. Order at KevinMentor.com and get over $1,000 in bonuses. Head to KevinMentor.com. Welcome to the Sharkpreneur Podcast. This is Seth Green. Today, I have the good fortune to be joined by Chris Rudin, who you may have seen on the Rocks TV show, Titan Games. He is an amputee keynote speaker, published author, disabled pro athlete, and adaptive model who uses his disability and disease as a way to inspire people to turn adversity into advantage. Chris, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. So let's go back in time. How did this all start? I was born with a physical disability. I didn't always have this super cool prosthetic arm. You know, I was born with two fingers on my left hand and a shorter left arm, and uh, mental health, especially with men, is kind of stigmatized. So growing up in a bad lower socioeconomic area, I just thought I was a monster. I hid my disability for 17 years up until three years ago. And I pretended to be confident. I pretended to be happy. But inside, I was really hurting. And I was extremely depressed in the sense where I had to put on a mask, or specifically for me, a glove, and hide how I actually felt. But it killed me every single day. And it took a long time to go from being disabled as a sense of being broken to having a disability and being myself, you know? What do you think were some of the most important factors in that mindset shift? Because as Tony Robbins says, pain is a part of life, but suffering is optional, which I see a quote about that on the wall behind you. So how did you go from, obviously the physical thing didn't change. How did you make that mental shift? I think there's some important factors. I, I didn't surround myself with the right communities. Uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. looking back. And we can always say, oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. I think pain is an extremely important factor into change. And a lot of people are in this purgatory of not enough pain to change, but not enough happiness to, to be where you want to be. So you're just stuck in the middle of this wanting things to be different, but never willing to pull the trigger, never willing to actually change. For me, I, I set up little milestones for myself. But those milestones, even though they seemed like goals, were actually deterrents to say like, okay, well, I can't change now, even though I could, it, because conditionally I needed this, 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 and this to fall into place. I needed the stars and moon to align, and then maybe I'd put myself in a position to possibly change. It was all BS that I told myself that uh, I needed to happen, but it wasn't a necessity. It was a desire to off-put the discomfort from actually changing. And little moments where I met certain people throughout my life helped me to make that decision. But ultimately, I don't know that I was ready to change or ready to pull the trigger until I uh, kind of came to terms with, hey, listen, this thing you've been sweeping under the rug, this hurt that you've been pretending like isn't happening is actually hurting you. It's actually killing you. And not only is it killing you, it's killing the person you could potentially become and the potential that you could offer other people. When I shifted my mindset from it's hurting me, me being hurt wasn't enough to change. When I told myself, you're being selfish, and I was like, what? How am I being selfish? You're being selfish by hurting yourself. You're hurting the message that you could give other people. You're hurting the image you could give other people. You're hurting that former you that you said you wanted to help by continuing the pain to yourself and the who you could become. And I was like, damn, that kind of internal monologue shift was everything. Do you remember, was there an inciting incident? Was there a day, was there a moment when you said, when the light bulb went off and you said, oh my God, I'm hurting myself, I'm being selfish. Was there a moment that you can remember where you said, this is it, no more, 
it's now a must. I have to change this. I wish I had that like sexy <laughs> disnification of moments. There was many moments, but there was one specifically that uh, I recently remembered. I was, I started speaking while still hiding my disability because I, I truly believe that I want to show people authenticity. That's if I had to choose one word to describe myself, it would be authenticity and almost to a fault because I'm a little rough around the edges. But I remember walking down this long hallway at a huge diabetes event, 2000 plus people uh, that I was speaking at. And there was this little girl, she's like seven or eight years old. And I had spent the whole like week with her. It was a week long event, I'm walking down this hallway and she grabs my glove, the, the one I'm hiding my disability with, just grabs it. And I'm mortified, like instantly. I'm usually really stoic about like things that happen. I'm very like, you know, emotionally removed, but I'm like panicking. And she just smiles and she's swinging my residual limb, you know, that I'm trying to hide. And she's like, it's okay. You don't have to hide around me. I was like, of the thousands of people at this event that want to take pictures with me, that want to do all this stuff and pick my brain and take from me, you know, I feel like she was the only person that saw me. And I was like, man, I'm, maybe I'm not as good at hiding as I think I am. <laughs> maybe, you know, everyone knows. Maybe I started filling my head with these maybes and those maybes started to like a catalyst of, all right, this is what I want to do. I want to not have the glove. I want to not hide. I want to be unapologetic, unapologetically me. I want to stop being disabled and stop being broken and useless and helpless and less than. I want to be myself. And I think there's a space that I can exist with my disability, with my diabetes, with my autoimmune disease, and not for those circumstances, you know? So I started making those little shifts and I set myself a goal that if I ever got a prosthetic arm, I would take my glove off and I'd go public, so to speak. I'd come out, so to speak. And I eventually got the arm and I made a YouTube video and I just thought it would just kind of exist and it would help me. And that went viral, millions of views and like all this stuff happened and uh, Washington Post picked it up and got on a TV show with The Rock, then went to Africa and spoke to uh, a village for type one diabetes and just kind of got thrown in the deep end. And I feel like that was the best thing that ever happened. I bet. So that is an absolutely incredible journey. I'm sure the long, I mean, you did that really fast. I'm sure the longer version could probably fill a book if it hasn't already. So let's talk about, so that's an amazing journey. You've overcome so much adversity. What do you think were some of the personality traits that were most valuable to you or that you developed that helped you get through to the other side? I think uh, finding one of the books that was like pivotal for my like kind of turnaround was Ryan Holiday's The Obstacle is the Way, uh, more so because it was my introduction into stoicism. And I'm not a stoic philosopher, but I do have philosophies from stoicism that I think really changed me. My ability to learn how to domesticate emotion so it doesn't destroy my actions, you know, that that was huge for me. That was a personality trait for me is uh, learning to control thoughts and understand that thoughts don't need to be invalidated. I did this for a long time and this really helped me. I used to think, no, you shouldn't think that. No, that's a bad thought. No, this is bad. And I was like, wait, why am I demonizing thoughts which genuinely serve as protective mechanism? You know, why am I demonizing these things for existing instead of dealing with them properly? For so long, I shoved things away. I pushed everything away. And it wasn't until recently, honestly, in the last year that I discovered maybe I shouldn't push them away. Maybe I should listen to why they're happening and just not invest in them. You know, if you have a random crazy thought, it's not that it shouldn't exist, but why, why not just not invest in it? You know, why not accept that? Hey, oh, you're afraid of being a loser. Oh, you're never going to win. Oh, you're never going to achieve anything. Okay. This is my mind telling me, Hey, I'm scared that if you don't win right now, you're going to be hurt. So I'm trying to protect you and stop you from even trying. I appreciate it, but I'm confident in whether I win now or later that I'll find something that'll work. But thank you for that protective mechanism. You know, kind of rewired my thoughts on those, those, those thoughts. And uh, that personality trait, I think, really carried me. Yes, the mind is a wonderful servant, but a horrible master. You are absolutely right. When did you make the... You talked about the moment with the girl at the conference with the child at the conference when did you decide to start speaking in the first place i started speaking about four years ago and it was always a dream but like a dream like a 
like a dream that you push off, you know? Uh, I remember one of the secret questions, my first ever like bank, it was like, what's your dream job? And I was like, a uh, motivational speaker. I didn't even know what that meant. I didn't know, you know, that was a possibility. I originally wanted to be a lawyer and I was in school for political science because I loved arguing with people. And I thought that this is a skill. I've always loved English and language and communication, but I ended up going to exercise science because I loved confidence too and mental health and the body. It wasn't until a buddy of mine had a nonprofit uh, for diabetes that I came in, we don't have a speaker. I'd love for you to come and speak. I'm like, I'm not a speaker. He's like, but you have a great story. I'm like, but I don't even know what I would say. You know, I ended up doing it and a standing ovation. People like, this is, this is what you need to do. Like, this is what that validation, you know? And I was like, okay, I'm obnoxious and uh, intense with anything I do. So I went, studied everything I could about speaking from the science of stories to like the delivery and communication, uh, going to Toastmasters and do everything I could to be a better speaker. And then I was like, I love this. I want to make this something I do for the rest of my life. I'm not selling things from stage, which I don't demonize anyone for doing that. But for me, it was just, I love the actual talk. I love the conversations that have that happen on and off stage. And I did 30 plus events for free. I was just like anything I could to build myself. And it took years of like, oh my God, this is never going to work. You're never going to be a speaker. The likelihood of this is slim to none to now being a professional speaker. My entire career is speaking, having a speaker's bureau, pitching myself and uh, being able to share not only my story, but the messages that actually resonate with people. The universal theme is overcoming adversity and people understand that whether you're a CEO or a janitor or someone in a third world country, the unifying concept of humanity is overcoming struggle. So I'm just fortunate to be where I'm at today and not have those mental struggles that killed me for so long. Well, congratulations. You've built yourself an incredible opportunity that keeps morphing into more and more opportunities. Um, how did The Rock Show come about? That was shortly after I had kind of came out about my disability. Someone reached out to me and said, we want you on a TV show at The Rock. And I was like, this is a scam. It was like late at night. They're like, we want to go on a video chat with you. I'm like, ha, no, not today. <laughs> I'm like, I know how that kind of stuff works. Um, I ended up, you know, doing that. And I realized 200,000 people applied to be on this show. And they reached out to me. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. But I'm like, I'm a power lifter. You know, I have a world record and all that power lifting, but that's just lifting one, one time. Not to discredit that, but it's very different than being like a high level athlete. So they're like, we want to fly you out to LA and you're going to compete against 200 other people for a spot on this TV show. I'm like, why not? I tried a 12 hour combine, all this crazy stuff. I went home and I was like, that was such a cool experience and such cool people, but there's no way. They chose 30 guys to be on the show and I made the cut. And then they chose three guys to be on the billboards and I'm on all the billboards with The Rock. And I ended up losing, you know, my, my season, but I got to share my message, hugging The Rock and all this stuff. And it went viral and so many people, hundreds and hundreds of people reached out to me saying, I'm struggling similar to you, whether you're old, young, just the messages from people. It was just a reminder that I'm doing exactly what I need to do uh, in my life. That's incredible. What were some of your biggest takeaways from that experience? Um, the difference between failing and failure. Uh, technically, I failed. I lost, you know, but failing is an adjective. It's like stubbing your toe. Failure is an identity, you know, it's uh, a noun. It's something you become, something you decide in the sense. And I will fail for the rest of my life, but I will no longer be a failure. I felt like I was a failure my entire life growing up because of something I never asked for. And now I just vow to be the person I never had by showing people it's okay. And it's even important to fail. It's just vital to never become a failure. That's why I love the gym. People see muscles, tattoos, all this stuff. But like, I used to do cake decorating. I was never into sports. I'm not that guy who likes beer or sports. I played drums, even with a disability. You know, I did the weirdest stuff. And even though I might look a certain way, like I found my comfort in lifting and just for myself, you know, because every time you fail to weight, if I went to deadlift 600 pounds and I couldn't get it, I would get excited because I was like, that's one more chance. That's one more step before I get it. You know, I learned lifting kind of taught me that. So, uh, man, just learning about failing and failure and what the difference is was a huge takeaway from that show. It showed me that I finally made it to the point when I lost, I wasn't sad. 
that thing that would have killed me back in the day of like needing to prove myself as a person with a disability, I no longer had. So that's how I knew I was growing. That is beautiful. Why do you think we get trapped? Why do you think we get in that place of, I'm not disturbed enough to change, you know, the, there, there's not enough pain to move me to do something and the pleasure I might get from changing isn't enough. Why do we get stuck in that hellish middle for so long? I talk about it in my book a lot in the upper hand. Uh, it's a, a concept I have, I think it's concept two or three, uh, burning your hand on the stove, but never taking it off. We get comfortable with the pain we know. We do. Mm -hmm. We almost become obsessed with the pain we know because the fear of the unknown and the fear of potential change is, is perceived as more painful than the pain we know that's hurting us, but at least we can expect it. When we have a, a habitual expectation of what's normal to us, there's so many people, including myself, I'm sure you've gone through it as well. We've habitually accepted the pain that we've identified as tolerable. We, the worst we've gone through, we said, this is not what we want. It's not okay. But what's more not okay is the fear of what could be. And we choose to tell ourselves, it's the way we kind of uh, wire our internal monologue. We choose to tell ourselves that the unknown could be more painful, which is a, a complete reality. But we negate the entire other side of what the unknown could be better. The unknown could be neutral. The unknown could be the same. The unknown could be anything else. But we take that little tunnel vision approach to telling ourselves it's going to be worse. And until we start to take a step back, a buddy of mine wrote a book uh, called Everyday Legacy. And he talks about you can't see the bigger picture because we're this close to the wall. And until you step back, you'll never be able to see the bigger picture. We sometimes get so obsessed in our day-to-day -day routines and our habits, and we don't even think about them on autopilot that we stop ourselves from seeing the bigger picture of, hey, I could change. Easier said than done, yes. Better done than said. I could change if I decided to say, take a step back and ask myself, is the way I'm thinking, is the way I'm dealing with these problems, one, are they effective? Am I gonna be proud of them looking back? That's a huge thing. That's something I use as a guiding principle. Is my decision in this moment, the way I think or the way I act, going to make me proud looking back? And two, the way I talk with myself, the way I deal with my current issues, is this something I would tell someone I love to do the same? The what? way I'm dealing with my problems, would I tell someone I love to talk about themselves the same way I talk about myself? And often that's not the case. Wow. How, uh, t how did the book come about? What inspired you to write it? I've wanted to write a book for a long time. I just knew I didn't want to write a book about myself. I didn't want like a biography. Um, I wanted... When I left stages, I felt so much happiness and transformation with people and people wrote me and there's a few people that wrote me years later saying that message was incredible. But what worried me was all of the other people. What worried me was the people who had that temporary influx of, I hate motivation because it's fleeting, but temporary influx of desire to change. But I feel like change requires consistency, you know? So I was like, what can I do to give people something of me in that process or of the message that they said was so impactful, but slowly, you know, lost its efficacy because I wasn't there, or the message wasn't there. So that was a huge driver for me. Give them something. Also, it being called the upper hand, uh, I make dad jokes all the time. I like to make jokes about my disability now because it's, I'm so proud that I'm in a position where I hid my hand for so long. And now it's so in the forefront of everything. People look at me and I used to hate seeing the reflections of people stare. Now I see a kid or a person staring at me. I move my hand a little bit and like freak them out. I, I just, I'm so proud to be in a position of uh, just changed mindset that to give someone the raw authenticity of these are the core messages, which I, ex I think they're the most important thing for anyone. You know, communication is key. Yeah, but that's step two. Self-communication is the most important and we've lost that. So I feel like I'm giving someone that tied with some comedy, comedic relief, tied with some just realness. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a guru. I'm not anything like that. I'm just like you. And I'm just trying to level with you and show you the perspectives that stop me from hurting. That is absolutely incredible. Where We know your time is incredibly valuable. We appreciate you spending some of it with us. Where is the best place for our listeners and viewers to go to get the book and to learn more about you? You can get the book on Amazon. You can just search The Upper Hand or you can get it on Barnes & Noble online. My website is chrisrudin.com, but I'm pretty heavy on social media, Instagram and YouTube. 
And if you write to me, like I will always write back. I always have uh, an ear to lend. And if you ever throw concepts or anything like that, I'm available. I'm not one of those like influencers that thinks, you know, everything's more important. Connection is most important to me. And honestly, what you do is, is so important for different communities and people who need to hear these messages. So thank you for what you do. My pleasure. Thank you for what you do. This has been Seth Green with Chris Rudin. Check out The Upper Hand on Amazon, on Barnes & Noble. Check out chrisrudin.com. Chris, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, man. Do you need money to fund your idea, product, or service? Are you ready to take your business to the next level but need capital to get it done? Kevin Harrington has heard more than 50,000 pitches and knows how to help you make the perfect pitch to get the funding for your entrepreneurial dream. He's distilled the process down in his perfect pitch cheat sheet, and it's yours for free. Just text PITCH to him right now at 727-888-2100. Text PITCH to 727-888-2100 right now and claim your free perfect pitch cheat sheet. Text PITCH to 727-888-2100 to start funding your dream today. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer.